Hi there. Let's uh, talk a little bit about drill core. Uh, my name is Dale Sims. I'm a geologist. I uh, live just inland from Newcastle. I'm here at the University of Newcastle's core shed, which is the closest place to where I live where I can get my hands on some core. So this is an introductory video, really just to help people who may be attending the five day core logging course we've got running uh, in Brisbane, the OzArmem AIG initiative. And, and that's an introductory core logging course, but I wanted to give some video support to people attending uh, that course so that they get some of the basics perhaps before they even arrive. And these are for people who haven't had any exposure to drill core or logging before, not seen any core or may not have seen a drill rig. So it's very introductory. So drill core is uh, a tube of rock. It's a tube of rock that's uh, drilled mechanically uh, by a machine called a drill rig. And uh, the drill rig uh, produces this core from a drill string that's uh, spun by the rig and advanced into the ground. And on the end of the, the drill string is a barrel and on the end of the barrel is a bit and the bit has diamonds um, in it and the diamonds wear the rock away as the tube of rock, uh, sorry, the tube of steel, the, the string or the, the rod string spins and the core is advanced up into the inside of that spinning tube of steel. Very simple really. And then uh, at certain regular intervals, the drilling stopped. Um, a tool is sent down the middle of the tube of uh, of steel, the pipe, the drill pipe, or the rod string and the core inside is recovered and that's what gives core that sits in trays like this. So we drill a lot of core in uh, the minerals industry and so this is to help you understand what can we do with it and how do we approach trying to understand the drill core. So here is a tray of core, just a single tray on its own. I can lift it up, you can have a look at it. It's got rows uh, in the tray, and the rows are filled with this tubular rock, the drill core. And the tray is read just like the pages uh, of a book, the writing on the pages of a book. So we start in the top left hand side. For this particular tray, that's the start of the length of core that's been put into the tray. And the bottom right hand corner is the end. So the core is read from left to right, advancing in trays, in the rows of the tray, down uh, from the top left to the bottom right. As I say, just like uh, reading uh, text, um, um, English text perhaps, in, in a book. Uh, and so, first thing you've got to check when you're looking at core is, are the trays around the right way? Normally they have something written at the start of the tray. Uh, normally they have start written at the start of the tray. And that tells you that that is the start of the tray, isn't that great? And at the end, normally they write end, which is fantastic. So logical. I don't know why it's so hard. Anyway, so we read the core in runs and, uh, and we observe the geology that the core contains. That's the whole reason we're drilling the core is so we want to see what the rock is. So the minerals industry drills a lot of core. It's all aimed at trying to understand what is the rock um, that the drill hole is intersecting. The hole was drilled in that position to get information about that, the rock in that location. That's the only reason that's been drilled, largely. So, um, inside of the trays we find things like this called core blocks, and the core blocks are put there by drillers. I want to talk a little bit about core blocks and what they mean and, uh, and what do we do with core blocks. Okay, so this block has got some writing on it. All core blocks have writing on them. That's why they're there in the tray. The reason they're here is that this has been the end of a run. This is where the length of the drilling, um, where the core has been drilled by the drill bit and moved into the barrel um, at the bottom of the drill string. Uh, that length has been, has either reached its maximum so the barrel is full and needs to be emptied or alternatively there's been a problem with the rock and things like maybe uh, broken material has wedged sideways into the metal tube which is the barrel and it's blocking the core from going further up into the tube. Either case means that the drilling's got to stop 
they unscrew the drill pipe, they put a tool down and they recover the core from the bottom of the drill string, from the barrel. When they do that, the driller writes a block to show what is the depth at that point where the drill has been stopped and the core has been extracted. So what we want to know, this block tells us at this particular point, what depth from the collar of the hole or the surface, what depth is that, um, is that position. And here the depth is 39.55 meters. And the driller has said they've drilled a length of 3.00 meters and their recovery is 3.03 meters. So their measurements show they're recovering slightly more core than they're drilling. Is that possible? It's not possible. It's showing that there's an error in core logging and core measurement. And error is a real issue that we've got to deal with whenever we look at drill core, because it isn't a precise science. There's imperfections in the system, and one of them is this uh, issue of measurement. So the driller's drilled three metres, he knows that, he or she knows that from their machinery, but the recovery has been measured on the drill core after it's put in the tray. And of course the core has been opened, it's been shaken out of a tube, normally belted with a hammer to actually to get it come out of the tube. And so rocks that are very weak and friable, a bit like these ones here, this little shale band, those rocks can break up and when they break up, they occupy a bigger volume than they do when they were originally in the ground. So that can lead us to recovery where we're actually getting more length than what we're expecting to get from the drilled length. Let me put that back before I lose it. So drillers blocks are written by the drillers and placed by the drillers into the core tray. They're not always right. Drillers blocks can sometimes be an error. We'll talk about it in a minute. So we've got two blocks here. There's a block at this position in the drill core, and there's a block here at this position in the drill core. This one says 45.55 as the depth from the surface. This one's 48.55. So the driller has placed this block when they had drilled the previous run, and then when they finished drilling this run, they place this block at the end of the run. So the, the block is always placed at the end of the run. That's when the driller has the opportunity to measure the depth of the hole. So, this is saying this position here is at 45.55, and it was after they drilled a three metre run um, and recovered 2.98 metres. Now, three metre run is the standard length of a barrel. Three metres is what a barrel will drill on its own. And this rock is extremely strong. When you look at it, it looks like concrete. This is a conglomerate. You can see the rounded class, and it's a very, very strong rock. In fact, they've got to break the rock to get it into the trays. It's that strong. Not all rock is that strong. Anyway, so this is the block from the end. It's saying that they've drilled three meters, and their recovery is 3.09 meters. Now, they know what they drill because they can measure that on their machinery um, through measuring a thing called stick up and then knowing the length that they've advanced the drill pipe through. But how do they measure recovery and how do we measure recovery to check the driller's values? Because we don't want to just be taking the driller's values um, on face value. We want to measure that it's ourselves. We want to check their distance. So we use a tape measure, a metric tape measure, a steel tape measure. And we start at the beginning of the run, immediately below the previous block, and we'll measure out to the end of this run with the core sort of pushed up nice and tight. We can hold the tape there with our fingers, grab the same position, come to the next run, measure along, do the same thing, hold the position there, measure along to the next one, hold the tape there, and come and measure the last one. So I get 3.06 metres, 360 centimetres, 3.06 metres. The driller measured and got 3.09. Now is that different significant? Not really. You know, the core does move around a little bit. It doesn't always match or mate um, perfectly in the tray, but it's really showing us in this rock we're recovering just about all of the core that we're drilling in that run, and it's because the rock is so tough. So, not all rock is like this. 
In fact, this is coal. I don't do any coal work, but I wish I did now when I see rock that's this tough, very, very strong. Right, so we were talking about uh, the purpose of drilling core is, is to understand the geology of, of the area that the hole's being drilled. And of course, really, we're trying to understand uh, what are the boundaries and what are the rock types within those boundaries. So it's about contacts. It's about developing an understanding of domains. So here in this core, we've got the uh, grey uh, concrete-looking rock. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll give it a squirt so we can actually, we might be able to see it a bit, a bit more clearly. It's a very beautiful rock, actually. Um, conglomerate, quite a, quite a problematic rock for coal because it's very strong. Uh, coal mining normally wants, particularly underground coal mining, wants rock that's going to fall down after the coal's been taken out. So we can see here the conglomerate continues up to this point, and then we get a different rock. So this is where the, um, the coal or graphitic shale commences. It's a totally different colour, you can see. And then further down, we come back out of the coal and we go into like a, um, a, a, a pale grey fine-grained sandstone here. So we've got some contacts. We've got a contact here between the conglomerate and the coal or uh, carbonaceous material. And then we've got another contact in here where we come out of the dark material going into the lighter grey sandstone. And there's a further contact just down there where we go back into conglomerate. So these contacts are what's important to us. We want to know where are those boundaries. So how do we know where the boundaries are? Well, we can measure them. Once we've established the depth values of the driller's blocks, and we do that starting at the collar of the hole, measuring from block to block to validate the numbers that the drillers have written on their blocks, so remember, there's the block there, 48.55. So once we validate that, we can use that block um, as a measurement point to measure any position further down the drill hole. So if I, if I take my tape and I, and I want to measure from this position down to the start of that coal seam, for example, I can again use my tape measure by uh, incrementally extending it, and I get it to about uh, 1.9 meters. So we've got 48.55 plus 1.9 is uh, 50.45. I uh, just have to, uh, yep, 50.45. So I can write that depth um, on my log. Uh, now depending on how I'm logging it, either on a computer or on a piece of paper, I'm just going to pencil it in. 50.45 is the depth at that boundary. And when you look at the boundary, you go, well, that's a bit odd because, look, here's the contact with the conglomerate. I can see it's actually at quite an angle. If this hole was drilled vertically, which is most, just about all coals, coal drilling is, then that contact is quite at an angle. It's not a horizontal contact. It's like 50 degrees. Actually, you can see it's got a little bit of shearing on it. So it's been... Uh, that's, that's made it worse, but it's got some shearing on it, little slicken lines, it's feeling very smooth and graffiti. So that's a little faulted contact, there's been some movement on that contact point. But basically here's our piece of coal, there's our depth on it, we can spin it around, so our, our depth was there 50.45, so there's a little bit of material being gone missing out of here, we've lost some core. Uh, and this is what happens in core drilling. That material might have just crumbled up and washed out when the water flushing the drill hole uh, went past this actual position as it was being drilled. Or it might have fallen out when, uh, when the core barrel was being emptied. Or it may have been lost in transit. It might actually be lying around in the bottom of the tray. It's just been smashed up because this rock's been transported. So, the principles though are that once we establish the depth of the driller's blocks and validate the recovery, then we can understand, uh, we can measure any point backwards and forwards between blocks. So for example, if we'd, if we'd validated this block as being three metres from this block, we could measure that distance either from here or we could measure that distance from here. It doesn't really matter if we've validated the blocks. Now, as I said before, you know, all worlds, it's all a compromise and often we get errors in drilling. We lose core. So here we'd lost a little bit of core in that, in that little wedge. 
we'd lost some of that material. But we can actually lose large amounts of core. We can use, lose meters and meters of core. Sometimes you can just have two core blocks side by side. They've been drilled three meters apart, but there's no core between them at all because the core has been lost. So core loss is another thing we need to deal with. And normally the driller, when they do their recovery, they'll notice if the recovery is less than the core length that they've drilled, they'll know that there's been a loss issue and they'll go to try and find where the loss has been and they'll quantify the loss on the block. And often they may say, uh, they might write on the block core loss, just to highlight to the geologist that they know they've lost some core there. So we're talking about these boundaries and the, and the changes in the, in the geology as we go down the drill hole. So the logging process can have different purposes. You may be interested in logging fine detail, mm, not quite on millimetre scale, but very fine detail in some areas. It might be very significant for what you're trying to do ultimately with the data. But as a first pass, my advice is to step back and take a bigger picture view. You're trying to find the main issues, the main contacts. So as we said before, we had a contact with, further up here, we had a contact between the conglomerate and the coal seam. Within the coal seam, we've got little layers and penny bands or shale bands, which occur within the coal seam. They're important to log. The details in the seam itself will have importance for the for the uh, the quality of the coal and how it can be used uh, once it's been mined. But on a broad scale, what we can see in the rest of the tray or the rest of the hole is is a lot of uh, um, areas where there isn't coal, um, but we've got large amounts of conglomerates and sandstone sitting there. The whole colour of the of the uh, drill trays is very much uh, light brown sedimentary rocks. So understanding where we've got from coal to fine sandstone, coming out of the sandstone again into conglomerate, those major boundaries are the important points we want to get at the first pass, the high level logging. We can come back and get detail, but we may not want to get detail on everything, we only want to get it out of a certain area. So this is one of the challenges of core logging is understanding what is the scale you need to work at? Because you can spend a lot of time logging core, collecting data, which is really never really used um, much at all. In fact, the bulk of the core data that we collect, I'd hazard to say, we don't use. We don't, don't use very much. So, focus on what's important. So we're just going to have a bit of a traverse down this hole. We're going to look for where the boundaries are. So. We're back in a conglomerate here. You can see some conglomerate. See the particles in it. Then it goes back into finer sandstone. We're getting some greyer rock here too. So we're going back into some more, uh, well, coal and graphitic shales. So we can see it's a bit like a barcode. There is white and dark rocks spread through the drill hole. So as I said before, it's those boundaries which are really important for us to try and get recorded in our logging. Don't get bogged down in the detail. But just before I uh, move on to some other core, this core size is HQ core. Um, so going from large to small core diameter, which is commonly drilled, um, commonly, HQ is probably about the biggest, most times we drill. There's a bigger size called PQ, which is drilled occasionally, but normally near the surface, particularly through poor ground near surface. More in Asia and New Zealand than in Australia, but occasionally used, particularly if people want to get large sample volumes. PQ gives core that's about 100 millimetres in diameter. This is HQ, so HQ core drills a 100 metre diameter hole but it only delivers a 75 mil diameter core because the difference between the core diameter and the size at the outside of the hole is the thickness you need for the machinery that actually allows you to do the drilling, the, 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 what's called the kerf of the barrel. So this is HQ, the next size down is NQ, 
NQ delivers a 50 inch core from a 75 mil, not 50 inch, sorry, 50 mil core. Let me try that again. So the next size down is NQ. NQ de delivers a, a roughly a 50 mil core from a 75 mil hull. And then less than NQ is BQ. Not commonly drilled from the surface, but often drilled underground. Or a variant of it may be drilled um, TT46. And BQ will give you a core that's smaller again than NQ. So all these core sizes um, fit within each other, they're like a Russian doll stacking, nesting, and that's to allow us to drill holes to a certain point and then reduce to a smaller core size and keep the hole advancing, particularly when we have difficulty in ground. This is a logging sheet. This is uh, typically what logging sheets look like. This one's called coal log, which is for logging drill core. It's a table that's got the depth from and the two depth of the observation, um, seam ply horizon, so they are trying to identify which particular part of the stratigraphy you're working with, and then issues around lithology, geotechnical, mechanical, sedimentological, and what minerals are observed. So these are rows. Each row represents an interval down the drill hole, and once the depth is established, then the parameters can be filled in across the table to develop a data base or a data table of information. So it's very common, uh, that sort of approach to uh, logging. Coal log is a um, industry supported logging standard. Very good system. So that was uh we start off there looking at that drill core from the coal drill hole. Uh, I felt distinctly uneasy because I'm not a coal geologist, although that was my first job as a student for three months, was logging drill core from coal drilling. But this was sort of the core we were looking at there before. This is the HQ sized um, conglomerate. Very beautiful rock made out of fragments, riverbed material. But let's compare it to this rock here. So this is rock from um, uh, a project in New South Wales called Woodlawn. Uh, Woodlawn donated some core to the university here a number of years ago and they use it in their um, economic geology logging exercises. So the first thing to notice is that, is that this core is much smaller diameter. So this was the HQ core. This core here is BQ. It may even be smaller than BQ. I think it's an underground drill hole. This could be what's called TT46, which is even smaller than BQ again. So different size cores. And when you look at this rock, it's quite a different type of rock. The rock mass is very different. Remember when we looked at the core from the coal hole, it was very solid. They had to break it to get it into the trays. Is, that, is this core like that? I don't think so. This core's been broken up. It's very fissile. When you look at it, it's got a lot of graphitic partings. It's very deformed. This isn't drill core from a coal prospect. This is um, a VMS volcanic hosted uh, sedimentary sulphide deposit. And so it's had a hard life. It's much, much older and it's been through a lot of deformation. And the mineralizing system actually introduces deformation and alteration as part of the process, which affects the rock. But the other feature is that the core is smaller diameter. And core, smaller diameter core is not as strong as larger diameter core. So it will actually break up more in the drilling process, particularly if the ground is highly stressed. Anyway, the principles are the same. We've got blocks here. The blocks are little pieces of plywood cut up and they've got numbers written on them. His uh, 81 meters is on that block here, 79.3, 84.4, 85.2. So those depths have been, those blocks have been put in by the driller at those depths. Let's just measure it and see if we can validate those, those, that, that distance. 
the driller hasn't written the distance nor the recovery on these blocks. So if it was right, if that was 79.3 and that is in the right spot at 81, then we're looking at 1.7 metres of distance. Let's measure it. So, we've got about 2.1 metres of distance there. So what could have happened? Why, we were expecting 1.7 and we've got 2.1, what's gone wrong? Okay, so this core has been sitting here for a while. It's been transported. It may well be that that block is in the wrong space. Hmm, that could be wrong. But if it isn't, what could, if these blocks are really in their right positions, where they were originally when the hole was drilled, what could be the difference? Well, you can see here, we've got a lot of cores being moved. There are a lot of gaps. So the core needs to be pushed up. Sometimes, if it's important, you actually rotate, or what they call jigsaw the core together. When you jigsaw the core together, it shortens the length. So if we fit all the core together, it actually reduces the length. So I think that's part of the problem we've got here. So we've got more core than the distance that we measured. So we were expecting 1.7, we got 2.1. So the core's been strung out. Now if, for example, we were expecting uh, uh, that distance of 1.7, but we measured it and we only got 1.4, then even with that spreading out, it doesn't accommodate for that shortening rather than lengthening of the measured interval. And normally what that happens, when that happens is uh, you've lost core. So the core has been ground away or been washed out or you've intersected a fault and the fault hasn't been able to be drilled by the drilling mechanism. And that's very common in, in uh, deformed, um, complicated mineral type ore bodies. Normal to get core loss occurring. All part of the fun. So here's, uh, here's another example. This is the woodlawn drill hole as well. Now this is core that's been you know gifted here to the university. So it's it's core that's already been through the minerals industry's processes. You can see some of it's cut in half and some of it's not. So when the core's been cut in half it means that the half that's not here anymore has been taken and, and uh, ground up and had an analytical process applied to it to get the elemental content of the core recorded. So it's measured or it's been what's termed assayed. The core has been removed, uh, taken away, pulverised and then um, tested with a series of, of chemical uh, processes or analytical processes to work out the metallic content. And that's important because this is a copper, zinc, gold, silver mine. And so they we need to know how much zinc, uh, copper, gold, silver, lead is in it. Now, uh, this core is, uh, is uh, getting on in its age. Not all core, uh, core is normally very beautiful when it's brand new. But uh, as you go on in time, particularly if the constituents of the core are sulfitic, um, you get these rusty zones, oxidation, and the minerals, once they're exposed to air, uh, start to decompose, and that, decompos that decomposition uh, modifies their content and, uh, and their chemistry and often releases acids and things. And so the core sort of slowly rots. And so uh, when you're logging core, you get the opportunity to log it fresh. When it's just been recently drilled, that is the best chance you've got of seeing it nice and clean. Uh, as the core sits around, gets to the point where at some stage it just can't be used. Um, now this isn't too bad. We can look at the core and get understandings of where the sulphide zones are, so we can see where sulphides are. If I smell the core, I can smell the smell of sulphur coming off the sulphide minerals. And there's a hard rock underground mining geologist, that's what I love, that's what I'm in the business for. But you can see the ground's quite poor, it's been smashed around potentially a fault or broken ground in through there. So quite different to looking at the drill core that we had there before. The other thing I'll point out is this funny little piece. This little, it's not a tube, you see, it's not quite a tube. It's a piece of core that started off like a tube, started off like this, but then it fell back down into the hole and it's at the end of a run uh, because 
it, it was a piece of core that fell out of the tube, fell to the bottom of the hole and they got over drilled when the drill rig went down again to start drilling uh, and, re and recommence the hole. So it's, it's a funny odd shape because it's been drilled twice. And because it's been drilled twice I know um, it was originally above the block. And so if it was located below the block um, then that's the wrong place for it because it was originally above the block which is where it was here in the trays. Anyway, I think that'll do. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys um, on our five-day core logging course. I hope this might have been some help to you. See you then. Cheers.